Hope people already joined and we can start. Uh, today we're gonna be talking about Selenium. How can we use it and how it can uh, how it can help us to automate different routine tasks. Uh, first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Vadim. I'm Python software engineer at SoftServe and working here for over two years already. And the previous year was uh, with, uh, was connected with uh, Selenium automation and different uh, as a different automation. We on, on our project, we are actively utilizing uh, AWS services. So I have a couple of certificates. It's Solution Architect, Associate and Cloud Practitioner. Uh, let's go through our agenda for today. Uh, we'll start with introduction, then talk a little bit about what is Selenium, how can we use it, how, where, how, how it can help us. Then uh, we're gonna talk about several steps. How can we start with that? How to install it? How to locate elements? Interact with them? Wait for them to be loaded? Uh, some basic operations. Then we're gonna dive deeper a little bit in Python, how we can use uh, Selenium with our Python capabilities, use different patterns uh, for customer error handling, for example. After that, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, threaded execution of Selenium scripts. Is it possible at all in general or not? Uh, if yes, how can we do that? And some interesting uh, tasks about that. And after that, we're going to talk about infrastructure cases, also several interesting uh, ideas on how we can run our tasks and uh, uh, some experience. And after that, questions and answer session. Uh, by the way, don't be shy. You can ask uh, any question uh, on the go, but if you're not sure, you can then ask them at the end of the presentation as well. Okay, then what is Selenium in general? It's a, it's a framework library or tool, call it whatever you like, but it, it provides us the ability to use different scripts to run uh, actions in our browser. We can, we can write scripts in five languages, in Python, C Sharp, Java, Ruby, and JavaScript. Basically, Java and Python are the most popular ones, but uh, JavaScript also pretty much popular. Not sure about the others. Uh, what browsers can we use? Mm, we can use Chrome, Edge, Firefox, Opera, and Safari. Basically, we can use some others, but Chrome is the most popular and really widely used. By the way, Selenium provides us with other abilities like custom browsers. Uh, they are mostly looking like a Python packages or for some other language, some other packages, and they help us use the capabilities of our language. For example, we have AsyncIO in Python and we can run a synchronous browser, like special for Python, something like that. Well, I believe it's enough with all that theory and uh, some ephemer ephemeral stuff. Let's get some hands-on experience. Um, we have an interesting thing called Selenium ID. I believe uh, all of us remember the time when we've been playing different games on a tel telephone or in browser, and we've been playing games like clickers or something that we have to find the path and draw it. And if it was really annoying to click all the time, so we would like to automate that. And we've been recording our actions and so on. So <laughs> here we have a new solution to our old problems. Basically, Selenium ID is what helps us to do that, to record the action in browser. Let me let me share how it works. Uh, just let's open some random window. Hide floating in controls, one second. Uh, let's go to some, for example, medium.com, just regular site. Uh, um, <laughs> one second, sorry. This, mm. Here we go. Um, it's not advertisement. It's already in my account, but it's I don't publish anything. So, for example, we have a web page. We want to click some buttons on it. So we can install Selenium ID extension, uh, create new project there, write uh, like project name test one, for example, and then uh, just create new test. Test case, find find the container, find the hello world, let it be. 
Okay. Mm. Then we're gonna uh, run the one second. Gonna run the test. So we're gonna go to that medium, start to play back. Uh, one second. Test. Oh, yeah, we start recording. We go to our um, web page. Then, for example, we uh, click button following. Doesn't really matter. Then we can click some any other button, start writing, for example. Start writing. What an interesting thing. Okay, exit page. So you understand that uh, Selenium ID is not the best option for testing some hard cases, but generally it looks like that. So you have mm, weird magic. Well, doesn't really matter. Okay, let's return back uh, to our um, Selenium ID. Basically, it provides us with the ability to uh, run the test that we click in browser. Uh, like we create clicked something, we made a history, and then we run it over and over again. How it helps us to automate tasks is that uh, you already know how to find the elements on the page. Uh, yeah, okay, let's move further. Uh, regarding not Selenium ID, but Selenium in general, what can we use it for? Mostly people use it for end-to-end -end testing. It's really easy and easy because we can test both API and UI and we just uh, learned one Selenium and that's it. We can test any edge cases where our user uh, interacts with our web page in a really different manners. For example, it not only provides us the ability to click some buttons, to send some forms, but also uh, you can create a stylus object and to write something on the screen, on the sensor screen, and it will be um, doing the same action. So you can test even such edge cases. But it's not the topic of today's talk. Today we're going to be talking about uh, automation, not testing. So for automation, we can use it for temporary or small solutions. It uh, sounds like the great example for it is mm, web scrapping. You, for example, you need to find 3,000 users in Twitter, not by their IDs, but by some weird names that only uh, shown on the real web page. So you have no API to that, and they are not planning to develop that API. So that is a great uh, approach. Uh, another one example is uh, development of uh, API in progress. For example, GCP billing, uh, guys from Google, for I believe fourth year already telling that they will create API for getting billing information, but they are not really interested in that because you have to, while you can easily see that information, you can download it, but uh, to do that in a programmatic way, they want the, um, you to store the information in their storage and you have to pay money for that. So it's just not uh, for, not that, not that easy, I would say. And with Selenium, you can automate that stuff. And a second case is legacy support. There are lots of hardware devices that have uh, some kind of web interface. And that device is already five, seven years old and nobody gonna update them because they're not supported already. So it can be different devices like printers, uh, UPS or whatever that is. And uh, uh, all of them have different uh, IPs. Uh, and for example, you are an administrator of that platform. So you have 3000 devices and you have to set up everything. And if something fails, you have to rerun that, restart, reboot or whatever. And that's where you, Selenium can really help you out. Okay, uh, let's dive deeper with um, the starting. Uh, how can we install 
Selenium. What, what do we need for that? For example, we want to run our script in Chrome browser. We need to have Chrome browser installed on our system and also we need Chrome driver. It's a special tool for Selenium to um, communicate with the driver. And we have uh, each driver for particular browser, browser. Chrome driver for Chrome, Firefox driver for Firefox and so on. Uh, and by the way, we need to install Selenium, but it's just pip install Selenium and uh, we can proceed. Um, here, here is the question. Uh, we can install it uh, in a programmatic way. So we uh, download the latest version of Chrome driver and then just unpack the ar archive to the folder we need. We can do the same with the uh, Docker file, but uh, you see here the version. Uh, the problem here is that uh, Chrome, for example, up, uh, Google updates the Chrome browser every every month, I suppose, so once in two months, something like that. So if you really deployed something on a server with the latest version, you should understand that you have to update your code on a regular basis, or you should update the driver on a regular basis. But if you're sure that you won't make any changes for a long time, so you can proceed with the uh, static version of the browser and driver and they should be the same otherwise you will get an error that your driver not supports the current version of the browser uh, and that that can be really a pain because for guys who are using it a lot they get the updates to the chrome browser really often and they need to install and do that all the time it's really painful so uh, guys from Selenium come up with a solution to that. It's a driver manager. Basically, uh, how before with that um, idea of installing browser uh, and driver manually, you can um, you have to pass the um, folder structure where it is located. Uh, so we install uh, and import all the necessary packages and pass the our path to the executable. With Chrome Manager, uh, with WebDriver Manager, you don't need that. It automatically installs the latest version of the driver. Uh, as soon as the script starts, it checks whether you have the latest version. If yes, that's great, we proceed with that. If no, it installs the latest and replaces the previous and you go. So you don't need to think about all of the stuff, how to update that and so on. It's, it's done automatically. You just need to put, uh, you just need to push the update button in uh, Chrome browser as soon as you have that. Great. So uh, how can we start the browser and what option do we have? Basically, uh, here's a code snippet. Uh, we create the browser with options. We have different options. We can, uh, for example, uh, there are pretty often cases with uh, unsupported legacy code, uh, legacy um, web pages, when they are not supporting HTTPS, only HTTP. So we need uh, argument ignore certificate errors. So uh, if we don't pass that, uh, the first page that we will have is a uh, uh, big, red screen with uh, warning that you shouldn't be opening this um, page and so on. Uh, this argument lets you just hide that and proceed with the real page. Uh, second one is um, headless. It's pretty interesting mode because uh, while you are working on your local machine, you would like to see what's going on. So after the Selenium starts the browser, you see that um, you have a window, it really clicks something and so on. Well, we will see it right after this slide. But if you want to run it on the server, we don't really need UI. Uh, we don't need it at all. So headless is a mode when you can mm, uh, when you can run everything on the background. You can create an open browser on the background and everything will be uh, run. Great. Uh, what are the options we have? We can say uh, no sandbox, uh, log level. It's just the level of warning that Selenium reports to us in the console. Uh, by the way, we can set up the size of the window on the startup. Uh, we can set whether we want a browser to be opened after the end of the script or we want to close a browser. So it all depends. 
And let me show you how it works. Um, here it is. Let's proceed with the easiest, smallest script. So basically what we do here, we set this window size uh, like general full HD and uh, headless. If we put this option, we won't see anything, but without headless, we can see that, um, mm -hmm, let me stop this one and run the script. We will see just the browser creation. Actually, it will be that fast that we won't even understand. Yep, because we need at least, uh, because, because we need detach mode. So now we can run the script and the browser will be open and will stay open even after the script is executed. Um, okay. So let's open some page, for example. We can do that with browser um, get and we can get the same medium web page. Medium.com, mm, here we go. Mm -hmm. mm, great, we're already on the proper page. Um, okay, what else we can do with this uh, magic? Uh, we need to somehow interact with that element on the page. It's like, first of all, we need to locate that element. We need to find what element we want to click, we want to hover, we want to send something there. And then we must understand what comments we have, what we can do with that element, and how can we wait for that element to be loaded. Let's start with the locating. Uh, there are different ways of locating that elements. We can do that by class, by selector, by ID, by name. Here's all of the examples. But the most interesting is uh, doing that, well, there are other like link text. It's a link of the text. So um, we have A and then proceed with that by partial link, tag name and XPath. XPath is the most interesting stuff that we have here. Uh, how how it looks generally? Um, let's let's open the same um, browser window. Leave so this one will be closed, and let's uh, let's open our page. How can we find that XPath? I understand that most of us not uh, front-end developers, or at least not used to do lots of uh, stuff with on the front-end side. So we can do that by just hovering on the element and going to the copy element X pass. Full X pass means all the tree from the HTML will be copied. It's not really beautiful to me, to be honest. So copy X pass is the uh, most most interesting solution. So then we can, for example, let's find this our story button. And button, it will look like uh, uh, button equals brow mm -hmm, browser find element by xpath. Then we just pass this. Uh, Second, it would like us to have such walls. Uh, um, Here we go. So, and we can then execute the action. For example, click. Here we go. We have already our browser open, but if you pass this uh, detached mode, uh, make sure that you close all the windows because otherwise you will get like 20 windows, so how much you want, how much you will open the browser. Uh, personally, I uh, like to put just brick point and it helps me uh, understand where I am. And then after the end of the script, it will be closed. So here we go. Mm -hmm. And we found, we clicked our button. We can just click the back and understand that we really clicked that. There are other options for that. We can do that with um, just regular text. We know that we have uh, text, uh, our what? Our story, great. And we can, uh, by 
text. Uh, and uh, we can just find it. It will be looking something like that, our story. Mm -hmm. We can even do that in XPath. It's really interesting. Mm, looking here, one second. Mm. What abilities provides us XPath? We have different functions inside of it. So we can uh, find uh, some text on a page, then uh, go back to the previous uh, element on the tree and go to some other mm, tree. For example, here we have a table and we need to find the checkbox. Checkbox on the same line, on the same TR, but different TD, so different style. Uh, another one interesting thing is that we can find input, uh, some random one with uh, name we have, name, and then we have we can find uh, last name in any of the elements down the line. So we like find one element and then we uh, search inside only this one element, not the full web page. Then we can do with the ID and uh, we can even have some logical oper operators. So we have ID name or name name. So we have attribute name. Pretty, pretty interesting, and we can do completely different stuff. For example, uh, XPath looks really, really horrible to me because it's really huge. And here we can use function contains, uh, contains text. Basically, we can find our story and it will also find it, but I'll proceed with this one. So we stop the script, it will close the uh, uh, browser automatically and runs it again. And we will have completely the same result. So here we go. Yep. Let's stop all of that stuff. Great. And return back to the presentation. Interacting with elements. OK, what can we do with our elements when we found them? We already know that we can click them. That's, that's clear. But we have a couple of different other operations. We can send keys. Send keys, it's uh, sending different data to the forms, to uh, any element that we have input inside. We can pass some text value or whatever that is there. So we like input mail. Mm, we also can clear the field. So we find the field, then we clear. So if something was written there, we clear that and put send keys like admin, localhost, dev, whatever that is. Uh, we have submit button, so a submit function. Uh, this function provides us visibility to send form. So it's more about API or something like that. We don't really, um, we don't really uh, pass the elements. We just uh, find the form, then we pass the parameters that we want to be um, sended and submit that. Mm, great. What else we have? Oh, we have weights. Yeah, that's a great uh, topic. For example, when uh, when we open the browser and open some web page, uh, we need to wait for the elements to be to be loaded. Because if no, then we will get just a simple error because uh, like there there is no such element on the page, and it will be really. Not the most beautiful one because it's like 10, uh, I don't know, maybe 100 of lines of exception, something like that. Looks horrible. So uh, you have you have several options. You can just put time sleep. <laughs> so you sleep for 10 seconds and it's really not the best option because it's just wasting of time. If the element was loaded in a second and you sleep for 10, then you waste nine seconds. Uh, another one interesting option that uh, Selenium provides us with is implicit weights. Basically, it works as a similar time slip, but it's it waits only for the element to be present. So if you set implicit weight to 10, then it waits uh, for this element uh, 10 seconds. If it doesn't appear, it throws an error. If it appears, we go and uh, do the action with this button or with this element. 
Uh, and we set it up at the very beginning of our script. It's kind of an option. So it will wait for all of the elements to be loaded for two seconds. Uh, and even more interesting one, we have explicit weights. It is a weight, it's kind of a function for the uh, elements. And it waits not only for the element just to appear on the uh, screen. Some elements cannot be can be not clickable and we wait for that element to be clickable. So we uh, here we have uh, some revealed button, for example, then we set up wait object, wait object with the amount of two. Then we find uh, some other button that we want to click, but it doesn't really matter. And here is a magic wait until we uh, pass uh, kind of a function and the property. So we wait this element revealed to be displayed for two seconds maximum. And if we have uh, no such element, then we throw an error. But we can wait not only for element to be displayed, we, when, uh, we can wait for it to be clickable, to be visible, to be, uh, it's up to 10 or 12 parameters, to be honest. And it's better to read the implementation because there are pretty, pretty many of them and they are developing rapidly fast. Uh, great. Well, uh, it's uh, enough with uh, basic theory and documentation. We're going to talk about some real practice, real uh, situations. For example, uh, we have we would like um, to get some uh, custom errors when something goes wrong. Uh, it's not about testing. For example, we when we do tests. We don't really worry what errors we get. We need to have everything working. So we just need it to, to execute, to be executed successfully. But here in automation, we need these tasks to be, uh, if something goes wrong, we need to know what's wrong. So we can came, uh, fix that and set it up and start working. Okay, now let me show you how the um, error looks like. For example, we can type some different stuff and it, we won't find such element. So we will get the error here. Uh, here we go. Yeah, we've got an error. And it looks like that. It's really painful to watch that and nobody knows. Only when you start investigating, you understand that on this line, you get some error, that there is no such element but doesn't look uh, pretty and you won't put it in logs for sure. What can we do with that? Uh, we can uh, create some um, try accept blocks. For example, customer and handling, yep. We can create a structure like, um, we can set up our error cured. It will be a flag that uh, indicates that we have no errors for the previous element because when we uh, do execute the row of action, if we didn't succeed with the first action, we shouldn't be really passing to the second because the page is not loaded. If so uh, we understand that our previous action was executed successfully. When the, we then try uh, next action, accept, and we proceed with that. That uh, looks not that bad. Uh, but imagine that you have a row of row of actions, like fifteen actions, and you have uh, like for one action you have five extra lines. So it doesn't really be useful. As a code that can took twenty lines, it will took you one hundred. So it's not really not really pleasant. What can we do with that? Uh, the solution that we came up to is a uh, decorator. We just pass this try accept block to the decorator. And here, here how it looks. We have our get login page function and we execute the only action here. In our decorator, we pass the error message that we've got. And uh, if something goes wrong, we just uh, log that message here. Uh, so it works like that. Uh, let me let me share the code with you. Error handling for me it looks something like that. So we have we create instantiate the uh, um, like instance of our class, 
we have on init you have our browser created and we set up our uh, statuses uh, attributes then we have our like top two functions and the entry point and at a point we just execute our two functions in the order that we have to and we would like us to have uh, so generally the script will execute all the same that we've got before it will open medium page and click our story uh, great but uh, mm, let's let's do that uh, it works completely the same mm -hmm. here we go uh, okay yep sorry guys i run the wrong script here we go and everything is fine okay and we got that brick point stop all that great so for example we have uh the names that we don't have here how it will work uh it, it will open the get medium page and then on this click button by name uh, we go here, uh, we understand that we have no errors, then try, and here it fails. And great. Uh, we catch that error, and uh, error reason set up our uh, errors that we have here. And finally, we will just get our we have error and error reason printed. And the script won't execute further, even though we have such structure, because and then after the uh, for the next function it will all, it will also check is it successful or not we can try and check mm, basically i will remove the brick point so we'll, we'll get it much faster uh, we open our browser and we get the error error killed while clicking the button it seems really hard to do but if imagine you have like 30 functions like that and one decorator will really save, save you lots of time lots of uh, code and it will be looking much more prettier uh, okay you've got that next interesting case mm. uh, we came to our um, trading and multitasking I imagine that you have a task to perform same operation 3000 times well, that is a task with, uh, it can be uh, scrapping uh, 3,000 3, users in Twitter, in Facebook, or whatever that is, or just some spam service, I don't know, can be different. But uh, we understand that each operation takes two seconds. So basically, it will be uh, 6,000 seconds. It's near, I don't know, maybe two hours, mm -hmm. something like that. So it's really, really long time. What can we do with that? We can open as many browsers as we need. We can open two, three, five browsers and execute that actions in parallel. So how it looks like. Basically, we create the function for creating the driver and we have it in headless mode because in other way, we will really have that amount of browsers on our desktop. Uh, then we <clears throat> create um, the function that set up our Threadful executor. Uh, for example, we have uh, as worker, five workers, like it's um, yeah, like it's shown here. So we just submit our uh, operation and the device is a file with our links to the drivers and that's it now it's relatively easy mm, just execute all the logic that we've had in parallel great <laughs> okay what we what else can we have that that was pretty simple but imagine that um, we are developing an application for the admins of, of that uh, IoT devices. And they have really huge amount of them. They have tens of thousands of the devices and they regularly fails, regularly we have to restart them. And sometimes we can have a platform for like, we have one, two, three, four, five platforms 
where we can set it all up. And the challenge here is we can only one admin can have one session at a time in one browser. So we cannot open really two browsers and such execution doesn't work. So when we open second browser, it kills the session of the first one. That is a challenge. What can we do there? Uh, by the way, I should uh, uh, I should say that if there is an API for that, we should definitely do that via API, not via Selenium, because it's not that much reliable for sure. Okay, what can we do? First solution, uh, for, uh, yeah, I should say that we are creating and providing user interface for that admins, and within one hour. Uh, interface, they can interact with different platforms and so on. Imagine that we have only one platform, um, but we have different admins. What can we do with that? Um, <clears throat> basically, we can create many credential pairs. So it's not the best option, of course, uh, but we can set uh, create like a pool of credentials for our server. Uh, for example, out of five, credential pairs and we have we know that we have six admins or like 10 admins and we can say to some of them that um, uh, if uh, our server is busy please guy just wait a second uh, so first one first uh, admin came and opened his browser as something executing here second one came and executing second browser and so on and when, for example, this one finished, another one can came and uh, take the first browser. But if it's too many of them, it will get uh, just 429 uh, HTTP error. Sorry, too many requests. Uh, the pros and cons of such uh, solution. The main, uh, well, we can easily expand. Uh, I mean, we just add another browser by adding another credential pairs. And it's relatively easy to create. So we just create new thread for new browser and we go. It's really easy to maintain. The drawback of such solution is that we really have to create too many users on that platform. Like it's, it sounds even strange. So it's, it can be not the best solution actually. But uh, okay. Uh, we know that we can have many tabs open in one browser. So instead of such solution opening one browser, for each user, we just create, we can just open a new tab for him. Um, and sounds great because we can open 10, 12 browser tabs and that's fine with one credential, sounds great. So it solves our problem with uh, too many credential pairs. Let's, let's take a look at it. So basically Selenium unfortunately doesn't provide us with the ability to create tab and execute them in parallel. So you have to have to play with it around for a while because uh, if you want to do that in really in parallel, you have to switch between tabs uh, every time as uh, Python switch its threads. So you shouldn't really rely on thread at pull executor. You should create your own threads, create your logs or semaphores or something like that. And as soon as you give the log back, uh, you uh, you switch the tab for the user, for the next one user. So we have one tab for each user and that's, that's really painful to be honest. It's not the best solution because if some new developer came to your project and say, and just take a look at it, uh, he will be shocked because uh, that, it's not that popular to see semaphores and all other stuff just for such um, easy task as to set up something. So the pros of such solution is it's pretty much optimized, but it's really hard to maintain and it's really hard to scale because we have only one browser and it depends on the amount of tabs. Uh, and we also have to limit our um, amount of tabs because if you start uh, creating like 10, 12, 12, 20 tabs, the time for execution uh, for one user will grow really because we execute them basically one by one or something like that. And it will really take uh, two times longer. In our previous solution, we was sure that the amount of time 
for the execution of the operation is the same. So now we cannot be that sure and one um, call can take really long time. That's also the drawback. Okay, whatever the option you choose, it sounds not that bad and it will be working, but still. Uh, okay, what we've got? Well, we, we are thinking that we are really smart, but we, we've got and faced another one problem. For example, you are using uh, fast API or Flask or whatever the server you use, you have workers there. And the question here is like, why we just cannot expand? We've got another one uh, guy here. Why we cannot create another one instance of that server? Or we have Kubernetes cluster or whatever we have. Why we cannot just uh, run another one worker like like that and send this actor to the server too? So sounds, sounds, sounds great. But here is the problem. We cannot do that because we have uh, our credentials shared, shared pool of the credentials or shared pool of browsers. And when we have it only isolated for one process. So if we run separate instance of our app, it will have the same credentials and any um, session here can broke, can break any session here. So we are not sure about anything and we cannot really expand that. And that's really not the best scenario, to be honest. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, we, of course, can think about different solutions and uh, way um, around, like create Redis uh, and set up keys there and get them and put them back. But that's, that's not really the best option. Uh, what can be other solution? Kind of a little bit infrastructural solution, but we can create uh, our web server and we create just the task queue. And we, as soon as we have our, some person or admin came to our server, we just submit his task to the queue to other server. Or we can create a background thread and do that there. So whatever that is, but it should be isolated, separated, credence shared pool on the side of these workers and web server on its own. So it will be submitting another server if uh, exists here, like web server two, it still goes and writes a new tasks to the same queue. And here we get them, the tasks and get them executed. So in such approach, we really can expand and um, make like run more servers and we can run more workers and that will be the best solution in such case but it all depends on how much time you have how much resources you have and the really need of that business for example it's if it's just one time setup you can run everything even from your local machine or whatever that is and everything is done set it up great but if you have real applications that, that is used by many people, you should consider this approach as the best one. How can we set up that all? Um, we can do that uh, just creating EC2 server and running tasks puller here. So basically how it works, a tasks puller is a program. It's pretty old one. It's, I believe, 20 years old or even more. Uh, as uh, Linux appeared, we have tasks puller. Basically, it creates just another one job on our operating system. And it everything is handled by the operating system. We don't really care about anything. Second one solution is salary. We can do that. We can submit our task to the task queue in Redis or whatever that is and execute them with workers in salary. Uh, and it will be also pretty pretty good option. Another one is... Uh, uh, SQS and let's go a little bit in some uh, SAS in AWS. We can create uh, just a queue, uh, send the queue, uh, the task to the queue, and we can run some Lambda services. It all depends on how many tasks you have and so on. Uh, because if you have uh, just a couple of tasks, you can easily run them on Lambda service, and uh, you won't pay in lots of money on that. If you have uh, something that is running all the time uh, as an option, you can, and, and the traffic is stable, you can just run EC2 uh, server and that tasks puller. 
especially if you have some already existing server and with some background tasks running on it. And uh, you can even create some kind of Kubernetes cluster, but uh, here is a problem that uh, some once you can submit a task to restart 3000 devices and it will be a really problem because uh, Kubernetes won't have enough time to expand that fast. And it just, you have the loaded load and uh, it will be, it just won't work well with that. So uh, these options are pretty, pretty much the best that we've came to on our project. And uh, basically that's, that's all that I would like to share with you. Hope it was interesting. And if you have any questions, you are, you're welcome. You're welcome to ask.